Good morning. I'm working. There we go. Hey, let's thank the band, everyone, for their hard work and dedication. Mark, thank you so much for the the new song and the others. It's good to hear your voice again up here on the stage. That was great. Um, how's the family this morning? Everybody have a good week? We we had a good week. Anytime we get to go fishing, that's a good week, you know. So, and when you win, it's that much better, right? <laughs> the early mornings don't work for me. I I don't know why those tournaments don't start around noon, you know, instead of at three and four in the morning. That gets a little tough. But we're glad you're here this morning, and I hope uh, all of you had a good week. And this morning service uh, will bless you with your experience here today. I pray that you leave here today, when you walk out, you can say, I felt God in this house today. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning and we're just so humble. We're thankful for all the blessings and favor you continue to show here in your church house. Father, be with us today. Father, we pray that you'll forgive us of our sinful ways and our shortcomings that we, that we have while here on earth, Father, in this flesh. Father, we pray today that uh, someone would be touched. Father, that their hearts would be open and ready to receive what it is you have for them today. Father, we thank you for the hearts of each one in this church that are serving you. Father, and we pray that your hand would be upon them all. Father, we pray that everything we do today, right here in your house, will be pleasing, glorifying, and uplifting to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You know, this has been a pretty fantastic week for me. I've completed several jobs I had working for my business. I have accomplished a few uh, projects at home that have been long overdue that we kind of let slide. And I've also grown smarter this week. I hope you have too. I, I found some things that were a learning experience for me. And uh, one was last Sunday night. If you weren't here, I learned that the youth of this church understands the functions of the church and exactly, exactly how to hold church service here in the J. Bar C. Cowboy Church. They did a great job, great job. They did a, such a fantastic job, all the way from the music, all the way through to the preaching. They did a fantastic job. Another thing that I learned is I learned you don't have to be educated <laughs> to be a fisherman. You know, to see the hearts of the youth was remarkable. And we know what he meant to say. But just the way it came out was hilarious. Uh, we had, like Sandra said, we had the dog in the baloney from the last service. This one we learned all about, an educated fisherman. So it was good stuff. And if you weren't here, you missed a great event. As much of you probably figured out, if you've been coming to Cowboy Church here for a very long time, or if you've gone to any Cowboy Church, but especially in this one, it's a little different than traditional church. We do things a little bit different. Uh, they, um, we're a little bit more relaxed. Uh, sometimes we get right up on the border there where we have to be careful that we don't forget that it is a church. It is God's house. And uh, I think part of it is, is because when you walk in the doors here at this J-Bar, C. Cowboy Church, and I hope at all the churches that you walk into, you can be who you are. You, you can relax and, and be yourself. That you don't have to put on airs. You don't have to, to, to be all that to be part of a church family. That's what makes a family work is each one of us have different traits about us. We have different little quirks about us and the whole deal. But when you can all come together for this short period of time and become one, God really appreciates that and He blesses that. So... You know, it's, it, it is a little different. Cowboy Church, you know, I, I never forget that one of the biggest problems that people have with Cowboy Church is a cowboy wearing his hat in church. How can you do that? How can you, how can you do that in God's house? 
Well, in the temple, men were asked to cover their heads. Now, I had somebody get really angry at me about that. Because I told them maybe they were reading it wrong. (laughs) They were not happy about that. I can't find in the Bible anywhere where God tells me how i got to dress to go worship Him. He says, worship me. So we need to, we need to be comfortable with that, that style. As long as your heart is right and you're worshiping the Lord, once again, if you're doing it for the right reasons, then God will bless it. Some people even ask this question before they come to church. When they find out I pastor a cowboy church, they say, uh, do I need to be a cowboy? Do I have to own a horse? Do I have to have cattle? The answer, of course, is no. You don't need any of that at all. If that was the case, the cowboy churches would be or have a very low level of attendance because of the real cowboy culture that people portray that the churches are about. Now, we do like the cowboy culture, but we also say that it's a country culture. Because we have more probably country folk here, or small town folk here, than we do real solid cowboys. There are a few in each church, but I think if you're going to find more of those real ranching, working cowboys, you're going to have to get up in the north. Get a little bit further out in the west. You know, because we don't see that around here as much anymore. You know, there are not very many real cowboys left in this world today. The real working cowboy. Hollywood, you know, it's always portrayed cowboys as hard drinking, hard fighting drifters, spending their pay in uh, saloons and bars, or having a shootout on Main Street. That's how they're portrayed. But maybe at one time in history, some of them were like that. But most of them were hard-working, honorable men. It, it didn't have anything to do with the limelight of what Hollywood portrays the cowboy to be. It seems like today there's not as much need for the old-time cowboy as there used to be. The day of the lone man in a line shack with his, just his dog and him alone... That's all he had to pass company with is a thing of history long ago. It's not as well known today or done today as it was in the past. You know, the cowboys are men that pioneered the West. And they're very important in our history and to society of today. They made it a safe place at that time for women and, and children that were raised without all the comforts and protection that we have in society today. And it's unfortunate that the cowboy of yesterday are now a vanishing breed. It really is. It's, the cowboy culture was different in its own right. It, it, it is kind of, it's kind of its own little thing. You know, they had their own codes. Cowboys did. They had their own code that they went by and they lived by. One thing that they did is they, their word was positive. If they gave you their word, they stood by their word. And a cowboy was more than just a horseman. He cared for the land before it was politically correct to do. He was respectful to the ladies and generous to little children. He was a knight in dusty boots, not a knight in shiny armor. And today, horses have been replaced by ATVs, tractors, and pickup trucks. So that's why you no longer see as many of the real work in cowboy as you have in the past. But one thing you could count on. One thing you could count on in a real cowboy, his word was his bond. When he said he was going to do something, he did it. And he took pride in what his word meant to him at that time. This is one area that I think that our society falls down in today. This is one area I feel like that Christians fall down in today over and over again. That their word no longer is their bond. Seems like today, our yes means maybe. Maybe. 
instead of yes being yes. There's a difference in, in the change in culture and what it, what it means to you. In the past several weeks, I've talked to several people about how we should trust in God. We've done it here at the church. And we've talked about how God should trust, can God trust us? But I believe one of the things that we need to ask ourselves through all that, because it's been remarkable of the people that had said, hey, I want everybody to know I trust in God, and God can trust in me. These stickers are seen everywhere on trucks, boats, cars. You know, we're beginning to see them on horse trailers. These little stickers that say, in God we trust. I see blue shirts everywhere I go all around Ellis County that say, in God we trust. I thought this was a phase. I thought I started a little phase here. My wife kind of set up for me that would run its course in two or three weeks and it'd be done. It hasn't. People have really promoted, sent pictures, and wanted people to know they trust in God. Amen? Now that's a positive thing, and God bless that and, and, and wants it to continue to go forward. I hope you're proud of what you're doing with that, and you're proud of showing people who your God is. Today I would ask you, can God and other people trust your word? Can God and other people trust your word? Is your handshake your bond? Is your commitment to God and others the real deal? Or is it just lip service? Because that's what people give a whole lot. They, uh, they give their word, and then they wind up having to go back on their word over and over again. You know, I want to tell you someone that knows about someone keeping their word. I want to read you a little story here. Several years ago, the Peanuts comic strip had Lucy and Charlie Brown practicing football. Lucy would hold the ball for Charlie's place kicking, and then Charlie would kick the ball. But every time Lucy had ever held the ball for Charlie, he would approach the ball and kick it with all his might. And at the precise moment of the point of no return, Lucy would pick up the ball and Charlie would kick and the momentum unchecked by the ball, which was not there, would cause him to fall flat on his back. The strip opened with Lucy holding the ball, but Charlie Brown would not kick the ball. Lucy begged him to kick the ball. But Charlie Brown said, Every time I try to kick the ball, you remove it and I fall on my back. They went back and forth for the longest time and finally Lucy broke down in tears and admitted Charlie Brown, I have been so terrible to you over the years, picking up the football like I have. I have played so many cruel tricks on you, but I've seen the error of my ways. I've seen the hurt look in your eyes when I've deceived you. I've been wrong, so wrong. Won't you give a poor pennant girl another chance? Charlie Brown was moved by her display of grief and responded to her, Of course, I'll give you another chance. He stepped back as she held the ball, and he ran. At the last moment, Lucy picked up the ball, and Charlie Brown fell flat on his back. Lucy's last words were, recognizing your faults and actually changing your ways are two different things. That's the way it is with our word, amen? We realize where we have a fault in that area, but we don't always change for the better. Are our words absolutely not what we portray it to be. We should strive in every way in our life to keep our word true and trust. During the days of Jesus, the Pharisees would add additional statements and clauses to their testimonies. They would, by swearing to the heavens, swearing by Jerusalem, swearing by the head, by their head, as a way of assuring, their, uh, assuring others of the reliability of the word. Rather, they're putting up a show. They're trying to show everybody, I'll do all this, I swear by this, and my word is good. And that's what they were trying to do. Two places in the Bible, we find what God tells us about keeping our word. If you turn with me, first of all, we're going to uh, James, chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 12. It says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, so not, do not swear, 
not by heaven or earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you would be condemned. Now let's go to Matthew. Do what? Is that in the wrong place? All right, good. Okay, let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Make sure I get it to the right place. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 33. It says, Again, you have heard it that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, <clears throat> either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by, by the earth, for it is His footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that, this comes from the evil one. Jesus says here, if people are to be such people of integrity, that there's no need to back your words up. There's no need to have to embellish your words so they really mean something to somebody. So that you don't have to appeal to a higher authority or a holy name or a holy place. Let your actions be your words. You don't have to do all that. You don't have to swear by that. Because if you are walking with God, if you are living under His commandments, then people should believe your word to be your word. You shouldn't have to try to persuade them that they are. They should be able to look at you and see Jesus shining out everywhere and believing that your word is good. Amen? He says simply, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. Now that's not complicated at all. But sometimes we can't quite get there. We've got to persuade people that we'll do the right thing. We shouldn't have to do that. If we were truly living a Christian life and walking with the Lord, then what we say should be true. How many times have you heard, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? We have people who can do that. I used to say Buster Bram, Bramble's a good example. He talks the talk, but he walks the walk. That's where you need to be. That's when you know your word is good. You back it up with who you are, not what you say. Can you today be known as men and women that can keep your word? Can people take it for granted that your word is your bond? That's pretty tough stuff. Can they believe that if we say we'll do something, can we be counted on to do it? It's getting harder and harder to find people that really can do that in this society. You have to agree with me. So many of us get let down all the time because we counted on someone to do something because they gave their word they were going to do it and it never got done. No matter what the importance to you were, it wasn't that important to them. Our word and trustworthiness is built up over a period of time and is proven by our behavior. You know, it's, it's, it's the same as when you get married for the very first time. You know, you have to prove yourself to each other. You have to prove that trustworthiness. You have to prove your word is what it is when you make that commitment. And I think it's a, a building of time that people get to know you and they can look at you and say, hey, that... That person, I know they'll keep their word. If they told you they were going to do something, they're going to do it. Our, contact, our, our conduct, both in and out of the limelight, what's that look like? In public view, can we be the same person as we are at home? Is your integrity in place that your word reflects Jesus Christ? Or do you have to be one way in public, one way at church, and a different way at home? Are you doing that? Are you the same all the way across? I find more and more that people are not genuine. What they are on Sunday morning, what they are in public, behind closed doors at home, they're not who they say they are. 
They're not being what they say they are. And it's pretty sad when you deal with children. Do you know your children throw you under the bus in a heartbeat? And they do all the time. It's not my place to come talk to you about that. It's God's place to convict you of what you're doing. If you're doing that today, I will tell you, you're being sinful and you're wrong. If you're going to be someone out in public, you're going to be someone in church, you need to be that same someone all the way across the board. We're confusing people. As Christians, we're confusing people that we are Christians and we believe in God and we follow God's Word. Yet, they get to see the part of us that we don't. Our Word's not any good. We let people down and we act differently than what we say we are. That is in society today and it's growing worse and worse all the time. A man or woman whose word is their bond lives their lives in the presence and full view of God. Now if you think you're hiding something, you're not. They speak and behave in the ways of the Lord. So their word and their trust is guaranteed. They don't have to say, I swear by God. They don't have to say, I swear by anything. They can say, my word is what it is because Jesus Christ is in me. It doesn't take a bunch of boasting, a bunch of praying over someone with a false prayer. That happens. People say, hey, I'm going to pray for you today, and they never do. It's just their words. I see that happen quite often. If we make a commitment to someone and we give them our word, we'll do something, we should do it. Well, even if it makes us uncomfortable at times, because God will make you uncomfortable. We live as the flesh here on earth. And we're not perfect. None of us are. And none of us will be as long as we're here on earth. We make mistakes. But as Christians, we should be quick to acknowledge that we made a mistake and never, ever try to make excuses for the mistakes you make. Your yes is your yes and your no is your no. If you're wrong, you're wrong. That's all there is. If you're right, you're right. There's no other way around it. You can make all the excuses in the world of why you didn't do something. You didn't keep your word. But that's what they are, is their excuses. Sometimes what happens in is in our desires to be of assistance to others, we can find ourselves where we can't fulfill a promise of our word that we made someone. We just can't do it. Because we had the desire, but possibility there was no way we were going to be able to do that in the first place. We find ourselves taking on more tasks than we can handle. We commit ourselves to doing or saying what we want to do just unable to complete the task at hand. So you should be a little bit more in prayer about something before you give your word on it. Rather, don't just say, hey, I'll do it. Because a lot of us that are servants and we want to do things for people and we want to help people, sometimes that's what we do. We give our word and we make a commitment and then we get down the road and we find out we really didn't have a place or a time or a capability of doing that. So now we kind of got a mess on our hands. And what do we do? We tend to stay away. We tend to ignore it. We tend to make excuses for it instead of being up front and saying, hey, I gave you my word. I made a mistake. I don't see any way I'm going to be able to do that. But we don't do that. We wait until that time passes. Or we wait until that situation comes to us and then we just ignore it. But the proper thing to do is say, I made a mistake. I am incapable of doing that. Because the desire was there, the heart was there to do the right thing, but the capability was not. It's good, but if you're in prayer about what you're about to do for anyone else, or you're about to give someone your word on doing something, if you're in prayer about that, then you'll understand where you need to go from there. God will kind of put a check mark on you and say, wait a minute. Plus you have that quiet time, that time to stop for a minute and reflect everything going on in your life. Our lives are so busy today that we're running 90 different directions, making commitments to everybody because we really want to help, but unable to get there. We need to face the facts that our heart's right, 
but we don't have the capability. It makes your life easier, and it makes the person you gave your word to's life easier. And they look at you more like a Christian than not a Christian. Be who you say you are. If we give our word to someone and find out we misjudge, go to that someone and ask for forgiveness. Don't give them excuses. Explain you made a mistake and you misjudged. Accept responsibility. Accept responsibility for those mistakes and misjudgments. If you have given someone your word and you find you can't do it, accept responsibility for it. Go man up. That's what we usually say, or cowboy up. Be truthful and say, hey, I did something or made a commitment to something that I, I, there's no way I can do it. I would like to, I really want to, but I jumped before I thought this through. And strive to keep your word. Strive to keep your word as most you can. I would say do it all the time, but you find yourselves in situations that can change. And since we're there, let's, let's just have a little review of what we're talking about in our lives that, to make that point. Are you keeping your word with God? You, you're the only one that's going to know that. Are you keeping your word with God? Are you keeping your vows and commitments that you made to God? When you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you gave your word that He would be the owner of your life, your time, your resources, and all that you have. Did you realize that? When you gave your life to, to God, you made those commitments. How's your word and commitment? How's it going with all that? How's that working out for you? Are you able to stay true to your word with God? How's your prayer life? God wants to hear from you. And we know you need to be in prayer to Him each day. But are you spending time each day in heart-to-heart conversations with God? Can He count on your word? Number two, are you keeping your word to your spouse? Remember your vows? To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. To love and to cherish till death do us part. Are you keeping your vows? Are you keeping your word to your spouse? Now, if you go back and read those words, I would assume that some of those areas are a little shaky. Especially if you've been married a long time. It's called taking for granted. We tend to do that. You gave your word before God when you got married. So are you keeping your word there? Are you keeping your word to your family, your children, your grandchildren, Is your word your bond? And are you teaching His word to your children, your grandchildren, your family? You made a commitment to them also. We know according to the Bible, God's word can be trusted. It's His bond with us. Aren't you glad that God gave us His Word on what He's going to do for us, what He's going to have for us when all this ends. Aren't we glad He gave His Word? And aren't we glad that we can trust His Word, that when the end comes and we stand before God, and we, He guaranteed us a place in heaven if we believed in Him, when we stand before Him, aren't we going to be glad that we said, hey, you kept your Word. You did exactly what you said you were going to do. Because we're going to have to say, forgive me because I didn't keep my word. Forgive me because I didn't keep my word to you. But His is trust, trusted. Strong. Where would we be without His promise of His word to us? Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. The, gr- the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of God endures forever. Psalms 33, 4. For the Word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. We can truly learn a thing or two from cowboys of the past. Truly learn a thing or two. 
many of them seem to understand the important things in life and how man's word revealed who he really was and what he really was. Deuteronomy 23, 23. Whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do, because you made your vow freely to the Lord, your God, with your own mouth. Numbers 30, 1 and 2. When a man makes a vow to the Lord or takes an oath to obligate himself by a pledge, he but must not break his word, but do everything he said. Today it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a real cowboy if you're a cowboy at heart or just a plain old city slicker, it doesn't matter. We just need to be a, be a person of God and reflect in Him through all our words and all of our actions. In an effort to bring others to know Christ, let your word be your bond. Let your yes be your yes. Let's stop making excuses for the letting of others down and strive in all the ways to be what God expects us to do. This week alone, I seen hearts touched, lives changed because of actions followed up by the words of people here in this church. God's pleased with you, I'll tell you that. And myself, I'm pleased with you also. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come to you today once again humbly thanking you for all that you do for us right here in your church house. Father, we thank you for your word, your word of salvation that you have promised that we'll have a place in heaven. Father, if we just truly believe in you and commit our lives to you. Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die on the cross for our sins. And Father, we look forward to that time when we stand before you. And your word will be revealed then also that we trusted in you. Father, today I know there's people here struggling. They're struggling with others that have let them down. They're struggling with life that has just kicked them to the curb. And Father, they may not know You. They may think they're at the end of their rope and there's no hope. But Father, today, I pray that You'd reach down and touch them. Today, if you're struggling with something in your life, if you're not sure that you have any promises, if you're not sure that anyone's Word can be kept, then take it to the man that guarantees His Word. If you're struggling with something today and you do not know Jesus Christ, would you pray with me this morning? Pray out loud. Pray silently. Pray however you choose. But pray this simple prayer and say, Father God, come into my heart. I believe in your word. And I accept you, Father God, as my true one and only Savior and master of everything I have. Father God, I believe you sent your one and only Son to die on the cross to cover my sins and shortcomings I have in my life. And Father, starting today, I commit my life to you. I commit my life to you. And Father, I believe through all this that your word is trust and good. And Father, I count on you and serving you. And we ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.